So certain extent it has been achieved, like flattening the curve has been achieved. So okay. the constant levels are coming up and constantly it is going out. Only yeah, the okay. level managing is. But but yeah, so the but the, the um, public health measures have been adopted well, or they've been handled well, or people have still adopted it. Now it's like uh, learn to live with Corona. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hopefully we won't have to live with it for too much longer. But I know it's uh, it's going to be a formidable challenge to roll out vaccines across across a, a country as massive as India. <laughs> it's the uh, next biggest challenge. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think I think in Scotland we have it easy, right? We have a population of six million that needs to be vaccinated, and um, it yeah, should be yeah. it should be achievable. Our biggest problem will be people saying they don't want it, but okay. yeah. I think we can start, Dr. Chetna. So shall we start, uh, Dr. Satish? Director Sir is in. One moment, I'm just going yeah. Hello, uh, Professor uh, Bela. It is Dr. Hi. Chetna here from CSI Rampri. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet you. Same here, sir. <laughs> Shall we start, sir? Yeah, sure. Hello, yeah. Professor Vela. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I hope you're all well. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Chetna Dhan. Uh, on the behalf of Electron Microscope Society of India and CSI Rampri, I welcome you all to the live webinar on recent advances in virus structure research using cryo-EM. So to begin with the program, I uh, I like to request uh, Dr. Amnish Kumar Srivastava, uh, Honorable uh, Director Sir from CSIR Ampri, and also the President of uh, Electron Microscope Society of India uh, for the welcome address and introduction of the speaker. Sir, please. So welcome to today's lecture on virtual platform. We are in actually 59th year of the foundation of Electron Microscope Society of India, as it was started in the year 1961. Professor Neeraj Nath Das Gupta and his other colleague scientists founded the Electron Microscope Society of India, in short, we say EMSI. And the first conference was uh, of EMSI held at Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, Kolkata. It's in India. Professor Dargus Gupta was instrumental in building Asia's first horizontal transmission electron microscope. Professor Das Gupta was also the founder president of EMSI when it was established in 1962. Since then, EMSI is prospering due to extraordinary efforts made by all the members and senior electron microscopists of the country in terms of quality and quantity both. At present, we have around 2,000 life members in the society. And also EMSI organized 12th Asia-Pacific Microscopy Conference in Hyderabad in India very recently, last February 2020. In addition to international conferences being organized by EMSI as annual event, the zonal chapters of EMSI are also very active in organizing various workshops, hands-on trainings, and seminars in the field of material sciences and life sciences both. This year, even in this pandemic situation, excellent webinar meetings are organized under the banner of EMSI, and many more are in pipeline. The co-host organization of today's event, CSIR Advanced Materials and Process Research Institute, in short, we say CSIR Ampli in Bhopal is one of the constituent laboratories of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research under Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. And CSIR Ampli is dedicated on pursuing research in the area of lightweight materials, smart and functional materials, nanostructured materials, radiation shielding and cement-free concrete materials, waste to value-added materials, and we also have a group called Rural Technology and Water Resource Management. It is my pleasure to invite you all 
on behalf of EMSI Northern Zone and CSIR Ampri Bhopal, and also on my personal behalf for the online live webinar by Professor David Bella, Professor of Structural Virology, Associate Director, MRC and University of Glasgow Science Centre for Virus Research and Director, Scottish Centre for Macromolecular Imaging on the very interesting and relevant topic Decent Advances in Virus Structure Research Using Cryo-EM. I think one of the most interesting and uh, very demanding topic which Professor David Bella is going to uh, teach us. Professor David applies the techniques of electron cryomicroscopy and image analysis to the study of viruses, providing an exciting opportunity to visualize the process of virus infection at cellular scale and at micromolecular resolution. It's a very, very important to understand the viruses structure, especially at this moment. At this junction, I would also like to thank Professor R.P. Tandon of Delhi University, Chairman of North Zone Chapter of EMSI for initiating an organization of today's lecture. However, he is unable to join in today's webinar because of inconvenience he is facing while he is staying in USA at present due to, we all know, time difference. So thank you, Professor Tandon, for connecting with today's speaker. So with this brief introduction about today's very eminent speaker and his research activities, and also about EMSI and CSIR MPRI as well, may I request Professor David to deliver his presentation on recent advances in virus structure research using cryo-EM. Professor David Bella, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very kind uh, invitation and your very kind introduction. Um, it's a, a great pleasure to be speaking to you all today. And um, I hope to tell you a little bit about uh, how uh, cryo-electron microscopy has advanced over uh, the last decade or so, um, moving cryo-electron microscopy from a, a relatively low res resolution technology to uh, being capable of achieving uh, atomic resolution structure determination or near atomic resolution structure determination of macromolecular assemblies. Um, I realize it is quite a, a, a broad audience. Um, so we can change this slide. There we go. Uh, I realize this is quite a broad audience, and um, some of you may uh, not uh, be uh, biologists. Uh, indeed, obviously, electron microscopy is a very broad discipline. So I thought I'd start out with a very general introduction to cryo-electron microscopy and how it's applied to structural biology, um, and then review some of the key technological developments over the years that have led to it becoming the, the powerful technique that it is today. Um, I then want to just take a little bit of a, uh, time to tell you about our own uh, initiative to establish a high-performance um, cryo-electron microscopy facility in Glasgow, which is a, a national center for structural biology research uh, in Scotland. And then I'm gonna just take a couple of snapshots from my own work uh, and work of uh, some other uh, leading exponents of the field uh, to highlight how the technology can be applied. And some of the recent uh, advances in both software and um, imaging methods that are allowing us to uh, probe features of viruses that have not been uh, accessible previously. Uh, firstly, how we can look at uh, small asymmetric features in, in these large symmetrical assemblies. And, and secondly, I'd like to say a little bit about um, the, the future of, uh, of cryo-electron microscopy and, and I think structural biology in general, which is uh, taking structure determination into the cell uh, so that we can understand um, the structures of viruses and viral components and indeed all macromolecular assemblies in, uh, in their context, um, which I think is really the sort of the, the future of structural biology. So to start uh, at where we were when uh, cryo-electron microscopy was invented. So I mean, uh, classical methods for looking at macromolecular assemblies in the transmission electron microscope were established uh, decades ago. Um, and have become really routine. Uh, this is a negative stain uh, electron microscope, uh, transmission electron microscope image of adenovirus, um, a virus that causes respiratory infections, gastroenteritis, but is also, I, th I think, of particular interest at the moment as it's being used as a vector in many um, coronavirus vaccines. 
so this is a, a very useful virus in that you can you can take out its replicated components and put in uh, uh, genes of interest and then use them to uh, transduce those genes into into our cells and then get them expressed. So uh, this is a very powerful technique and it's, it's, it's really exciting to see this, this virus being used in, 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 in the vaccines, uh, several vaccines going forward uh, at the moment. So yes, yeah, so this, this way of imaging is involved basically depositing your uh, macromolecular assembly onto a continuous carbon support, support film, uh, drying it and embedding it in a heavy metal salt, which of course then provides that sort of uh, highly scattering um, stain that, that gives us the, the nice uh, amplitude contrast that makes it very easy to see viruses. But of course, this is drying and staining process is very deleterious to our ability to uh, see high resolution structure, uh, structural details of the proteins. So in the 1980s, um, it was shown that uh, protein micromolecular assemblies and uh, nucleic acids could be uh, embedded in a thin layer of vitreous or vitreous ice or sort of frozen, wa frozen water that is amorphous. Um, and that, that could be transferred into the transmission electron microscope and imaged at low temperature. And the process of doing that is it, it was, was, was uh, published in, in, in the mid 80s. Uh, involves, so this is, this is what we all understand. All transmission electron microscopists will recognize this as a, as a TEM grid. It's a three millimeter copper foil that we would deposit our sample onto. In for cryo EM, this would have a, a, a continuous carbon support film, a perforated carbon support film on its on its uh, surface, uh, which allows us to uh, deposit our sample onto it. So we might pipette a three microliters or so of a protein suspension, and of course this now would be a couple of millimeters thick, so it's far too thick for the transmission electron microscope to uh, pass a beam through. Um, so we want to make that thinner. Uh, so that's trivially achieved by blotting our sample to make a, a thin film that's maybe 100 or 200 nanometers thick. And that's rapidly frozen by plunging into, into a cryogen such as uh, liquid ethane or, 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 or ethane propane mix. And what results from that is we have a thin layer of uh, glass-like ice uh, in which our object of interest is um, suspended in random orientations. Uh, which we can then transfer into the transmission electron microscope, microscope for imaging without stain, without dry, drying. So this is effectively taking something in suspension in water, turning that water solid, uh, and then imaging it uh, unperturbed by any, any uh, staining, drying processes. Uh, because we are imaging protein and not stain, the scattering properties of this uh, material is, is relatively weak. And we end up with relatively low contrast, noisy images of our uh, objects, such as this. This is a, an enzyme complex, is a, a large icosahedral enzyme complex called uh, lumosine synthase. Um, these images can then be, uh, of, of each individual particle, uh, can be extracted and computationally processed to extract the three dimensional structure information. The basic concept here is that we have. Uh, identical, assumed to be identical objects, uh, randomly oriented in the ice layer. And the computational challenge is really to work out how the different or views relate to each other. What are the orientations of each individual view of an object uh, so that those different particle images can be integrated to produce a three-dimensional density map of the, of the protein of interest. Uh, that computational process has undergone a lot of refinement over the years. Uh, and um, when uh, correctly executed, will produce a three-dimensional box of density values, uh, such as this. Uh, so this is now taking slices through a density map that was calculated from those images. And we can see the uh, protein is white and the solvent is dark. So uh, we don't usually represent our cryo-EM maps uh, as animations of slices, rather we would um, use a, a pseudo three-dimensional representation called an isosurface representation. Here we have simply told the computer uh, a, a threshold value that we consider to be the, the minimum density of, of the protein, and everything above that density is, is interpreted as being solid, uh, and a, a, a network of polygons is assembled to uh, enclose that uh, surface, that, that, that volume, uh, and then com computational ray tracing is used to produce this sort of quasi uh, sort of pseudo three-dimensional representation of the object. So these um, 
representations are very useful for interpreting the gross morphology. And we can then zoom in on the density um, and knowing the sequence of the protein that we're interested in, we can then begin to uh, build an atomic uh, model of the protein based on the density that we see in the EM maps. So hopefully you can see how the uh, atomic model fits into the uh, electron microscopy uh, density. Um, and this allows us then to effectively solve uh, the three-dimensional protein structure at the atomic level. And you may have seen recently uh, papers from a number of uh, labs that have uh, actually achieved um, uh, actual atomic resolution using this method. So this, this reconstruction was calculated at two angstrom's resolution, which is just short of uh, atomic resolution. Structural biologists tend to consider about 1.4 angstroms to be the, sort of, uh, the limit of, of true atomic resolution. But you can see even with a density at two angstroms, we can build a very, very detailed uh, and accurate uh, map, uh, atomic model of our, of our protein. So this is the process of uh, cryo-electron microscopy and how it leads us to uh, high resolution atomic structures of, of proteins of interest. Uh, and uh, as uh, it was stated in my introduction, I, I, I've spent most of my career trying to pursue this uh, with respect to uh, studying viruses. And uh, in most of that time, we focused on, on, on whole viruses. Um, I've worked in cryo-electron microscopy for uh, around, uh, well, since the early 1990s, so uh, coming close to, to 30 years. Um, and um, over that time, I've seen the technology evolve from a very low resolution, um, gross morphology uh, study of, of, of viruses to, to, the, to where it is now, where we can, we can really understand uh, macromolecular assemblies at such very, very high resolution. So how did that come about? Um, so as I said, cryo-electron microscopy as a concept, the process of uh, plunge freezing uh, of solutions of protein um, was invented in the 1980s. Um, uh, it was published uh, uh, most notably from uh, Mark Adrian and Jacques Dubichet. There were several other people working on it at the time, uh, but the, really the, the breakthrough papers I think were, were, were attributed to, to, to Jacques Dubichet. In, in the mid 80s. Um, in the late 80s, on the back of that work, we started to see the first uh, three-dimensional reconstructions of, of virus capsids from um, cryo-EM data. And I think this is particularly interesting. So I think, I think because viruses are large symmetrical entities, uh, and of course important entities, they've really um, been there as electron microscopy has developed over the years, right from the very first images uh, captured in, in, in the 1930s in, in, in electron microscopes uh, of smallpox virus or, 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 or uh, pox viruses. Um, every advance in electron microscopy and imaging has, has been applied to, to viruses first. Um, so very early on after, after cryo electron microscopy was uh, invented, um, it was applied to uh, solving these structures of, of virus capsids at comparatively low resolution. So this structure published of the herpes simplex virus uh, in a collaboration between my colleague in Glasgow, Fraser Rickson, who's now retired, and, and uh, Wa Chu, the sort of, uh, one of the pioneers of cryo-electron microscopy, uh, currently at Stanford, but has spent much of his career in Baylor College of Medicine in, in Texas. Um, they uh, published this in the, in the late 1980s, um, and it was really a sort of a groundbreaking uh, uh, achievement to be able to see the structure of these viruses at around 35 angstroms resolution. So a number of uh, technological advances really incrementally improved the resolution that was achievable. Um, and when I came into cryo-EM, 30 angstroms was a sort of reasonably good achievement. Um, but shortly after that, uh, the, in the introduction of uh, field emission guns uh, giving more co coherent illumination uh, combined with computational tools to uh, compensate for the effects of the contrast transfer function, uh, advance the technology to being able to achieve uh, sub-nanometer resolution. Uh, so this was achieved in the, in the, in the 90, 1990s, and, and I think one of the most notable papers of that time was this paper from Bettina Bircher uh, working with Tony Crowder, one of the pioneers of the computational methods of icosahedral virus reconstruction where the uh, protein fold of the hepatitis B virus capsid protein was, was determined from a density map at around six angstrom resolution. So computational improvements, uh, the improvement in the electron microscope, the field emission gun, of course, being a, a major advance, 
uh, led to this ability to solve uh, sub nanometer resolution structures. And at this point, we were still working on uh, photographic film. Um, but there were many groups who had seen that uh, advances in technology that were coming, most notably the introduction of uh, digital cameras, uh, would allow for uh, automation of the electron microscope. Uh, and that would be, uh, um, that has been a major step forward. So here I'm showing an image of uh, a software package called Serial EM, uh, David by, uh, developed by David Mastinati, initially to perform electron tomography, uh, but now also used for, for single particle data collection as well. Uh, Bridget Carrigo, of course, developed uh, a program, Legion, which was, I think, one of the pioneering programs to, uh, to test this process to implement this process of automated imaging and you can see from these low magnification images of of the um of, of, a, of a tem grid square where we have these regularly arrayed holes how this is a perfect situation for automation a computer can easily recognize these holes uh, operate the microscope and move the stage to uh where the where it needs to be to take images through these holes which is where we're interested in recording our our data so automation has been a, a, a huge technological advance that has allowed for uh, high resolution structure determination because we need a lot of images to process uh, and, and having a single operator sit at the microscope and collect 2000 images is a, a, a really big ask. Uh, so I, I, especially when a computer can do it. So these, these were developed by the, by the research uh, community. Um, we also have uh, both Make both of the leading TEM manufacturers, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific and, and JL, have introduced their own uh, proprietary automation software. Uh, and this software is, get, is getting better and better to the point that now it allows us to take multiple micrographs from a single hole in the, uh, in, in the quantifoil film. Uh, and using the deflectors instead of the stage, it allows us to take uh, shots from different holes. So you can move the stage to the center of the grid and, and shoot an array of holes just by using uh, the deflectors in the electron microscope to, to control the beam. Uh, of course, to achieve this, we need uh, excellent lenses and stable beam performance, low hysteresis. All of these advances have uh, contributed to the uh, ability of uh, electron microscopes to deliver the sort of data we need to achieve high resolution structure. Of course, the other uh, really significant breakthrough in the field that uh, allowed this technology to reach uh, atomic resolution. I mean, I, mean, I remember for many, many years at Gordon Research Conferences that we were agonizing, will, will electron microscopy ever achieve uh, near atomic or atomic resolution? It was just, it, would it ever happen? Uh, and I think probably the biggest breakthrough uh, after automation was um, the implementation of the direct detector camera. So uh, the first generation of electron microscope cameras, I'm sure you're all aware, were scintillator coupled CCD cameras. So we would have a, a scintillator that would detect electrons, convert those electrons to photons. Those photons would then be relayed to a CCD, uh, either by a lens or a fiber optic stack uh, that would then uh, convert the photons back to electrons, which of course is a hugely inefficient process that uh, led to a de degradation of the signal. So the ability to directly uh, measure electron uh, instance uh, on the camera through the use of uh, CMOS uh, monolithic active, active pixel sensors um, allowed a far more sensitive, uh, a, a far uh, more efficient detection of electrons. So the developments that needed to happen here were these, these detectors needed to be made radiation hardened, they needed to be made thin enough so that the electrons wouldn't go bouncing around in the detector and, and, and cause a sort of uh, blooming of the signal uh, so that we can accurately record where an electron lands on, on the detector. So um, <clears throat> the other great advantage of the, of the CMOS maps detectors is that they have this massively parallel readout giving very, very fast performance. Uh, so that we can uh, record movies uh, of images. So instead of on, on a CCD camera, we might record a one second exposure as a single frame. Uh, and if you have uh, the, the object moves in any way during that time, um, then the image is blurred, the signal is lost, and, and generally you can't recover high resolution information. So this was a huge problem for, uh, for, for many years, both when recording on film and on, on CCD, which limited our resolution. But now, because these cameras are so fast, rather than recording a single frame, we record movies 
uh, which can then be aligned and integrated to produce our final micrograph, uh, which allows us to correct for motion and also allows us to correct for a, the accumulation of electron dose in the sample uh, by a pro pro applying a progressively more aggressive low pass filter to our, to our uh, data later on in the exposure, excluding the radiation damage from the, from the image, a process called dose fractionation. And the upshot of this is that the, a micrograph like this of two bacteriophages, which uh, is clearly blurred, you can see that the, the, the object is moving and you can see on this big lump of contamination here how, how poor the quality of the image is. If that had been recorded on the CCD, it would go straight in the bin. Um, however, on a direct detector, we can then, uh, after collection, we can correct, we, after collection, we can correct the motion uh, and we can recover the sort of higher resolution information. So all of these advances have allowed us to come to the point where the electron microscope is a really powerful tool for structural biology research. Just to sum up some of these important developments, I've mentioned, mentioned automation, direct detection, improvement in methods for loading samples into the electron microscope, so we can load multiple samples into the electron microscope at once for rapid screening. Uh, stable stages that minimize drift um, and uh, tilt well for tomography are important. Improvements in lenses, improvement in software, both for the microscope and also for the three-dimensional image reconstruction. Uh, some other recent advances that have really made a big difference. So uh, it's been shown that uh, as uh, dose accumulates in the sample, the ice actually sort of moves and the objects uh, move. Uh, and this is, uh, has been linked to uh, poor thermal conductivity of the carbon support film that the ice is sitting on. Uh, so a gold, uh, a, a sputtered gold um, holy support film is, uh, has been shown to greatly reduce, reduce specimen movement, of course. So it's better to not, to not have the movement in the first place than to correct it afterwards in software. Another recent advance um, is the production of stable and usable cold uh, field emission guns. So actually some of the first field emission guns used in prior EM, uh, Bettina Birch's paper on hepatitis B virus core structure used a cold field emission gun in a Hitachi 200 kilowatt microscope. But the, but the cold field emission guns were very difficult to use. They require to be uh, flashed to clear away gases from around the filament. Um, and they were very, very difficult to uh, achieve stable illumination for any lengthy period. Improvements in vacuum systems have allowed us, allowed the manufacturers now to generate uh, cold field emission guns that are very stable, very easy to operate. And the great advantage of the cold field emission gun over the thermionic uh, field emission gun is that it has a narrow energy spread. So we have uh, um, uh, better um, um, chromatic, uh, less chromatic aberration as a consequence of that, and, and better uh, uh, transfer of high resolution information. Other important advances are uh, energy filters. So that's uh, effectively a sort of prism that removes uh, inelastically scattered electrons from the image formation. Uh, and, and, and phase plates as well as means of introducing phase contrast without having to defocus the microscope have both uh, contributed to the advancement of the field. So all of these technologies come together to bring us to the situation where we can now solve high resolution structures or objects uh, and particularly icosahedral viruses, these very highly symmetrical objects, uh, can, be, can be processed quite trivially to uh, compute a, a three-dimensional density map with sufficient resolution to allow us to build atomic uh, resolution. So this is, this is actually the first uh, high-resolution prairie-end uh, structure solved in my lab. It's, it's a, a virus that doesn't infect humans. It's a virus that infects uh, the freshwater shrimp. Uh, and is of uh, importance uh, from a food security and economics uh, perspective to, to many uh, nations, including India, actually, um, where, where um, Macro, Bracken, Rosenberg, I know the virus or, or, or the giant freshwater corn are, are uh, cultivated for food. So this virus uh, causes uh, catastrophic loss of uh, in, in hatcheries of these, of these uh, freshwater shrimps. So, we were interested in determining the structure of this capsid, so we developed this, we, we, we uh, produced virus-like particles from expressing the capsid protein of this virus and purified them uh, in collaboration with a group from Malaysia, uh, led by a PI called Cochlean Ho, a very nice fellow who came and worked with us in, in Glasgow. And from this density map, we were able to build a model of the asymmetric unit of the capsid. So these are 60-fold symmetric objects. Uh, 180 capsid proteins come together to make the whole 
virus particle. Uh, and what that means is that there are basically three uh, capsid proteins in unique uh, configurations uh, in the asymmetric genes. And this is what it looks like. And I, one of the sort of interesting things that emerged from this uh, study was this sort of this very long extended end terminal arm uh, of the capsid protein in one of its conformations, which we're able to resolve. And that actually laces together the structure uh, at, at the capsid interior. So this is now looking at that internal arm and how they sort of extend from, from one symmetry axis to another symmetry axis and interact with each other uh, to stabilize this, um, this, this these, uh, to lace the asymmetric units together to form this large uh, icosahedral assembly. So here we can see the internal arm extending out of this uh, shell domain here. So this is a ribbon diagram. It's just a simplified representation of the protein structure, because if I showed you this is, is, is a, a ball and stick atomic model, it would just be like looking at snow. There's just too much information. So we can see here that this, uh, this representation indicates the presence of beta strand, beta sheets. So this is hydrogen bonding forming between these, uh, these two uh, chains of, uh, of amino acids. Um, and this, this sort of kind of secondary structure is very common in the, in the uh, shell domain, the, the, the floor of the capsid. So moving from here, from this capsid, we can move uh, along. Uh, you can see that it, it comes uh, and, and along and binds onto its neighbors and it forms this, this beta sheet structure here with its neighboring uh, proteins. So it sort of in, inserts one arm into its neighboring uh, uh, proteins to form these extended beta sheets. There, it then moves on to the um, threefold. So this is the icosahedral threefold symmetry axis, where actually three of these N-terminal arms sort of fold around each other in a structure called a beta annulus, um, and we get a second uh, beta extended beta sheet forming here. So these these sort of this extensive hydrogen bonding network. Uh, laces these capsid proteins together. We saw several other interesting aspects of this, of this capsid protein, but it just illustrates the power of the technology to help us understand how these viruses come together. So that's the end of that um, internal arm, which terminates under a neighboring twofold symmetry axis. So. so you can see how from these sort of very high resolution density maps, we can begin to understand how these uh, proteins come together to form capsid structures. So I just want to take a little moment now to sort of say something about a little advert, I guess, or, or tell you a little bit about um, my centre. So I, I, I work in the MRC University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research, which of course is a, is a, is a broad dis multidisciplinary uh, research institute focusing on uh, human viruses and viruses at the human animal interface. And um, within that centre, I've established the Scottish Centre for Macromolecular Imaging which is a, a national center for structural biology research. It's actually a consortium between the University of Glasgow, University of Edinburgh, Dundee and St Andrews. Uh, and together we sort of uh, uh, were able to secure funding to buy a, a state-of-the-art fully automated uh, 300 kilovolt cryo electron microscope. Now, when we got the funding, that, of course, the market leading microscope was the Th Thermo Fisher Titan Krios microscope, which of course is a very established platform got a great track record and we actually used a, 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 a Krios to, to collect the structure, uh, collect the data that we used to solve that structure of the, the nodovirus there. Um, that was collected at uh, the Diamond Light Source, uh, the UK's National Structural Biology Centre in, in Oxfordshire, and a facility called the Electron Bioimaging Centre. Um, so most research groups that have funding for uh, this kind of instrument would, would probably go and buy a, a Titan Krios because it's a very, very well-established platform, very successful. And similarly, the market-leading detector is, is, is manufactured. Well, there are two, actually. The, the Thermo Fisher make their own. They have the, their own detector it's called the Falcon, uh, which is a direct detector platform. And um, GATAN, of course, make the uh, K2 and K3 uh, direct detection, uh, counting direct detectors uh, cameras. So when we got the funding, I think uh, we were all thinking we would, we would buy the same. But my lab has had a very long standing relationship with uh, the Japanese manufacturer of Microsoft JL. Um, we had up until that point been using a JL 2200, uh, 200 kilovolt field emission gun microscope. And um, I, JL took us to Japan to show us their prototype uh, rival to the Krios. <laughs> I have to say, we were really very impressed by it. 
Um, and it has a number of impressive features. Most notably, it had the cold field emission gun. It has a 12 slot auto loader, so we can load 12 samples into it. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, a very ergonomic uh, loading system, a very easy to use way of loading samples into the microscope and, and an in-column uh, omega uh, shaped energy filter, which is a, also a very easy to use uh, energy filter system. So we were quite taken by the, uh, the, the new platform. And so we decided to be early adopters of this new technology. So we, we bought the JL Crow Arm 300 uh, and, and, we, and we doubled down on these sort of, I guess, the risk or the, or, or the controversy of this decision by not buying the um, uh, GATAN uh, K2, K3 uh, microscope, but rather buying uh, a, a, a camera, sorry, buying our direct detector from a company called Direct Electron. So we bought the JL Cryo Arm 300 with the Direct Electron DE64. Um, and and being early adopters has come with several challenges. We, we, the microscope has been in for two years now, and it's take, it took us about uh, 18 months to come to the point where we could uh, begin to uh, offer a service. Um, of course, we were collecting data earlier than that, but, but the data collection was not uh, consistently reliable. But we've got to the point now where it is consistently reliable. Uh, we can collect high resolution data. And indeed, the lumazine synthase, the two strong structure I showed you at the beginning of my talk, um, was collected on our cryo arm, showing that this microscope is capable of achieving a uh, very competitive high resolution structure. The D64 is a, a pretty interesting uh, camera. Um, I just, I'm sorry, I'm just going to highlight here that one feature of the auto loader that we really liked is that the um, Thermo Fisher uh, Titan Krios auto loader works by loading 12 grids, up to 12 grids into the auto loader at one time. And those grids can then be moved to the stage and back to the back to the uh, magazine, but they go in and out in units of twelve. Uh, so either the, you know, everything's in and everything's out. Whereas the the jail auto loader is you load uh, grids in groups of four, and then they're held in a, a sort of a grid hotel in the auto loader, which is never vented, uh, or doesn't have to be vented uh, in order to get grids in and out. So it's very clean. Um, and it's uh, the vacuum is very good in there, and, that, and so grids can be moved in and out in groups of four. You can put four grids in, take one out, leave one in. So grids can be left in there uh, for weeks and weeks if you like, and they st and they stay pretty clean. Um, so that's a really nice, a really attractive feature of this microscope. So if you've got one grid that's really precious, and you image it, and then your time on the microscope is finished, you can put it back into storage without taking it out and risking contamination keep it in the microscope and then at the next available slot you can load it back to the stage and collect some more. So that's a really nice feature of this microscope. The other thing I mentioned there, the, the DE64, is a very very large camera. It's an 8K by 8K direct detector camera that can be operated in linear or counting mode. It's not super fast as the K3 is. Um, it's when operated with twofold binning, it, it, its performance is not dissimilar to the K2 in terms of speed, the GATAN K2 in terms of speed, but the um, DQE is, is substantially uh, better. But when operated in, in linear mode or uh, um, in counting mode for tomography, we use it in counting mode unbind, we get these enormous images. Um, so this is again adenovirus I showed you earlier. It's a very, very large object. It's 900 angstroms across. Uh, and when working on a small camera, it's very, very, very difficult to get a very large data set. However, with a, a large camera, uh, using a set from a single collection over two days, we were able to generate sufficient data to uh, solve the structure at um, 3.8 angstroms resolution, uh, which was uh, very nice. So this is a 3.8 angstrom structure of an adenovirus. We can zoom in on it. Uh, I haven't got a model to show you built into it just yet, but um, you can see the sort of quality of the, of the density map. We can sort of swing around here and have a look at the inside. You can see that the, the um, protein is very nicely resolved. And to do that on a on a on a sort of standard uh, 4K by 4K camera would have taken considerably longer, even even with the faster readout times. Because actually, in, in linear uh, data collection, the readout time is comparable. We we read out images about that we do, we do uh, one or two second exposures, so that the readout is reasonably reasonably quick and of course you're getting four times as much data for every micrograph. Okay so that's um, the 
uh, SCMI. That's sort of, I think, the basics of, of how CryoEM allows us to address high resolution structure. I just want to sort of take a few snapshots now of some uh, examples from, from uh, my lab and others uh, of how other developments in the field have allowed us to access new features of viruses. And the first one is, is dealing with um, asymmetry in icosahedral viruses. So uh, this is a study of Khaleesi viruses. So uh, we start, we've been working on feline Khaleesi virus for, for many, many years now. And we use this as a, as a tractable model for this virus family, uh, which includes uh, the important uh, human pathogen norovirus cause of, of, of outbreaks of, of gastroenteritis. Norovirus is very, very difficult to propagate in the laboratory and study. Um, however, feline Khaleesi virus, a, a cat respiratory virus uh, in the same family, is, is much easier to, to, to study. We can propagate it in the laboratory. So we can solve its structure. This is the three angstrom structure of this uh, viral capsid uh, solved um, using data collected in, in the University of Leeds at the Asbury Biostructure Laboratory. Um, but in doing this study, we have to, we, we assume icosahedral symmetry, which means that every feature in the virus that is not icosahedrally symmetric uh, is blurred out or lost. Uh, by, so icosahedral symmetry is both a blessing and a curse in, in, in this kind of study because we can, we can apply the symmetry uh, when we average the particles together to greatly reduce the number of particle images we need. But in doing so, we lose any asymmetric features. So we were interested in how this virus attaches to and enters uh, the host cell. Uh, and to study that, we produced a soluble fragment of the uh, receptor protein on the host cell surfaces that the, the virus binds to. And we mixed them together in solution and solved the structure of the complex. And we could see this extra density on the outside of the viral capsid here. So we can see these, sort of, these, these rods of density here. However, when we tried to analyze these density maps and, and build an atomic model into the density, we could see that the, the density was blurred. And the reason for that was that when the receptor bound onto the uh, virus capsid, these spikes suddenly became mobile. And so averaging them together we're using icosahedral symmetry or averaging them together even without icosahedral symmetry led to incoherent averaging of the density, uh, which blurred the map uh, and produced density that we couldn't build. So this was very frustrating. Um, and for a long while, we sort of felt we were stuck with this. Um, however, uh, I presented this work at a, at a conference uh, where I was uh, then, where I then had the opportunity to speak with uh, a guy called Shaw Sherez, who's the author of Rely On, one of the uh, leading uh, image processing packages used to calculate these structures. And he gave me some suggestions on how we might try to address this. And this was using a technique called focus classification whereby we can uh, focus the analysis down on a single spike in the viral capsid uh, and try and classify individual spikes into self-similar groups. And this would allow us to then reconstruct individual um, spikes rather than the whole icosahedral virus. Uh, but we've used the icosahedral symmetry of the virus to refine very accurately the orientations of the particles uh, prior to doing this. So applying this method, which was really, I, I felt witchcraft because we're focusing on very, very, very weak signal uh, in a large symmetrical object. If you just try and do the reconstruction without impl imposing symmetry, it will still come out being symmetric. And the reason for that is that the symmetry is, dominates the alignment so, so much. However, using a, a, a mask to focus the analysis onto a single caps, uh, capsid spike, we were able to resolve uh, the extent of uh, movement in these spikes upon receptor binding. And you can see the density map is getting better. Um, but we saw uh, in doing this, I noticed something unusual in the density map, which was just here, just at the edge of the field of view, just, at, just next to the thing we're interested in, is these sort of fingers of density protruding from the capsid surface. And we could see them at both uh, threefold symmetry axes in this analysis. And in these density maps, the in, where, where this feature was present, the spike was far better resolved and the receptor was far better resolved. So changing my attention from the capsid spike over to the icosahedral threefold symmetry of axis of the object uh, allowed us to reveal this feature, which had never been seen before. It's uh, a unique feature and a unique threefold symmetry axis in the capsid that emerges after receptor engagement. 
and you can see this this tube has arisen this is basically there are a spikes of density coming out from fingers of density coming out from the capsid surface and i hope you can also see there's an opening in that in that uh, capsid there now um and we think this is a a, a portal that uh, is there to help the virus reject its genome. So of course, these viral capsids, this is an RNA containing virus. These viral capsids exist to package and transfer the viral genome from one cell to the next cell. And these viruses enter the cell by a process called endocytosis. They attach onto the host cell membrane and they trick the cell into bringing the virus into a, a, a bubble called an endosome, a lipid bubble called an endosome. And the virus would then, if it stayed in the endosome, would then be um, effectively put in the dustbin. Uh, it would go to uh, what's called a lysosome, where enzymes and low pH would break the protein down and kill the virus. So what the virus has to do is escape from the endosome. It has to eject its genome out of the endosome into the cytoplasm of the cell to initiate the infectious process. And that was something that no one understood how it might happen. Now, this tube that emerges after receptor engagement is encoded by a, a protein called VP2, which was long known to be essential to Khaleesi viruses, but no one really knew what it did. Uh, and we hypothesize that what this protein does is, uh, is it inserts into the endosomal membrane and provides a channel through which the virus can eject its genome into the cytoplasm. So we were able to uh, identify this feature from cryo-EM data, and you can see the density map is far better now uh, following that refinement uh, uh, and focus classification process. We were able to identify this novel feature, we were able to attribute it to a protein, and we were able to attribute a function to it, and we were able to build a, a model of it uh, based on this density map. So this was, I think, a, a, a pretty startling uh, achievement and totally unexpected. We didn't go looking for it. For it. We were really trying to understand uh, what was going on with the receptor engagement. But in, in doing so, we got this amazing view of this unknown and previously unknown feature. And this is the power of our ability to, to break or break down the, 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 this uh, uh, symmetry of a virus and, and look at asymmetric features. And many other groups have had great success looking at how uh, the, in, inside the capsid, the genome binds onto the capsid interior um, uh, and how that interaction can drive assembly of viruses using these same methods, uh, and, and also looking at uh, packaging machinery in, in other viruses, most notably, of course, the large DNA-containing herpes viruses. We also had a paper on that. Uh, I'm not going to show you that data today, but um, those data today, but that um, that uh, structure was also sort of similar to this, uh, it, a way of getting the genome in and out of these large icosahedral uh, capsids. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about uh, in my talk is, is really, I think, what I, th I consider to be the future of structural biology, which is solving protein structure in its native environment. Rather than taking proteins out of cells and solving them in isolation, you want to understand their structure in the cell or in the host, doing what they're supposed to be doing and interacting with other components of the cell or other components of the virus. So um, how can we achieve that? So I think one of the most challenging, so single particle methods are, are really powerful at achieving very, very high resolution structure determination. Um, but in order to do that, we have to have uh, relatively homogeneous preparations of protein. So that when you average the density together, you get a coherent structure. Um, many of the most interesting biological structures are, uh, however, unique. Anything involving a membrane, um, or even a, a protein interacting with a membranous structure uh, is, is going to be structurally unique. So you can't average together, you can't average together a thousand views of a liposome and get a, a you know, high resolution liposome structure. So how do we get at these unique objects? Um, and the way we get at these unique objects is the process of electron tomography, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. It's, it's, it's widely used in in, uh, in electron microscopy, not just for biological uh, problems. So the concept of ele uh, electron tomography is, so in single particle uh, analysis, we have lots of different views of objects that we assume to be the same. In tomography, we take lots of different views of the same object, and we do that by rotating it in the uh, electron, electron microscope, uh, taking images uh, every two or three degrees. Um, and there are many more elaborate, I've, show, I've shown a continuous tilt here for my animation, but there are many more elaborate acquisition schemes which uh, focus the dose at the, at the, at the sort of low tilt uh, 
uh, views where the where the signal is, is better. This produces uh, a tilt series uh, images uh, of, of images uh, which can then be used to reconstitute the three-dimensional structure. So here we're looking at a tilt series of coronavirus particles and you can see these pleomorphic envelope viruses. Hopefully you can see the spikes on the surface of the of the, um, of the virions. Uh, that spike is what we're, we're vaccinating against. It's, it's the S protein is what um, mediates attachment and entry of the virus into the cells. And it's by far the most antigenic and, and, and we really want to target our immunity to that spike. So that, that's, that's why we're interested in the structure of the spike. Um, so this is uh, coronavirus in uh, tomograms. We can take from these tilt series, we can compute uh, the three dimensional uh, density map. Uh, here I'm showing you a denoise density map. So it's very nice contrast, very clear. Uh, Denoise using a, a deep learning program called Topaz, which did a very nice job of, of, of reducing the noise. Tomograms are required a very, very low uh, dose, so they're typically very noisy. But we can see the spikes very nicely. Uh, we can see the membrane and we can see how these particles are very pleomorphic in their structure. So we could take these tomograms and then we could try and represent them in three dimensions by a process of segmentation and radial coloring. And of course, this is a very low resolution view of the object. And that, that uh, restriction in resolution is relates to the, the uh, tilting regime where we don't, we're unable to tilt the object through 180 degrees. So we don't see the top and bottom of the object as clearly as we'd like. Uh, there's accumulation of dose um, and just very weak signal to noise. So we don't see, of course, this, this density at the, the sort of resolution that would allow us to uh, determine atomic uh, structures. However, by extracting these spikes and uh, bringing them into a common, common register and aligning them, a process called subtomogram averaging, uh, in the best case scenarios, these densities can be reconstructed at um, very, very high resolution. And I'm going to show you an example, not from my work, but from uh, a group working with John Briggs and Ralph Barthenslager, uh, where they have uh, done this with virions. They've done a subtomogram averaging uh, of, of tomograms, just like I've shown you. Um, and they've realized they've been able to show how these spike proteins are very, very flexible at the cell surface, at the, at the virus surface, how they're distributed. Uh, and, and by fitting um, high resolution coordinates from single particle analysis of purified spike protein into these uh, intermediate resolution density maps, they can, they can show uh, how this, uh, the, the mobility of this spike protein, which is something quite unique to this, to, to coronaviruses actually, it's not something you see so commonly in, in other enveloped uh, viruses. So that's one example of how this technology has been used for SARS coronavirus. Another, so that's, that's basically looking at structure in situ on a virus. But if we want to look at structure in situ in a cell, how can we do that? So one way we might consider doing that is by propagating the cells and, uh, and viruses on the TEM grid directly. This is what I'm showing here, which is, this is neuronal cells grown on a TEM grid. You can see these long neuronal processes. And these were infected with herpes simplex virus. And we were able to um, then uh, image directly through the neuronal processes, which are quite thin, to compute a tomogram of that neuronal process and visualize. So we can see, we can see actin, we can see microtubules, these components of the cytoskeleton. And here we can see herpes capsids trafficking along the neuronal process. Here we can see a herpes variant outside the cell, along with vesicles that are also trafficking. So this is something we can do. We can also look at the uh, thin cell edge uh, uh, of cells grown on the TEM grid. But of course, TEM is limited in terms of its electron penetration. So um, we can <coughs> image up to maybe 250, 300 nanometers uh, thick objects, uh, which is fine for the edge of a cell or a neuronal process like this. But how can we look into the heart of the cell? How could we solve the structure of a protein in the nucleus of a cell? So many, group, many groups have, have been uh, working on this and, and the technology that's emerged really is the gold standard for achieving this is focused ion beam milling, uh, which is, allows us to basically cut a window into the cell. So the focused ion beam microscope, it, the focused ion beam is something that can be built into a scanning electron microscope. So here in, in this figure, we can see, this is a figure from, uh, from a, a paper from uh, Alex Rygort and Jürgen Plitzko. Um, the, this is a cell grown on a quantifoil TEM grid. And you can see that the cell is maybe five or six microns thick, far too thick to get a TEM beam through. But we can use the focus ion beam to basically abrade away the, the material 
uh, and produce a fine uh, window called a lamella. Basically, you thin this cell down to 100 or 200 nanometers thick and then image it in the transmission electron microscope to, to look into the cell in its heart. And that can then be imaged by um, tomography in the same way and interpreted through processes of subtomogram averaging or uh, lower resolution features can be represented in 3D by uh, segmentation of membranes for argument's sake. So annotation to highlight where the, where the membranes are. Uh, and I'd just like to highlight the power of this by showing you a recent paper again on uh, SARS coronavirus uh, from uh, Ralph Bartenstager again, um, and uh, working with a friend of mine, Steve Boulon, and uh, uh, his, his partner, Megan. Um, and here they've used focus ion beam milling to, to look at uh, SARS coronavirus morphogenesis. So here we're seeing uh, viruses budding into the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and uh, here we can see virions forming inside the cell. So this is giving us a view of how these viruses assemble. Here we can see in pale blue, the nuclear capsid containing the viral genome, in pink, the, the membrane, and then in yellow, the, the spike proteins. So this is uh, really giving us amazing views of how these viruses assemble right in the heart of the cell. Uh, so I, this is what I feel, feel really is the future of structural biology. And I think uh, improvements in uh, tomography, improvements in computational methods will eventually allow us to extract very high resolution structure data from uh, processes such as, as these. So I hope um, that that sort of gives you a sort of sense of where, where cryo-electron microscopy is going. Some of you have made, may have seen the sort of uh, uh, the uh, publicity surrounding the um, latest uh, artificial intelligence deep learning prediction of, of, of protein structure. Some uh, predicting the death of uh, structural biology as a discipline because well, we can just put it into a put the sequence into a computer and get the protein structure out. But I think I think. Uh, this is really where, where structural biology is going. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's going to be a long while before uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence can predict protein structure and, and the complexity of, of the cell. <clears throat> so I shall stop there. And I'd just like to acknowledge the contributions of many people who've worked with me uh, on, on this work. And um, of course, I, just to highlight that those, those coronavirus things aren't, aren't mine, and I hope I gave the citations for those uh, papers, so please do go and read them. They're really great science. Uh, but in, in, Scotland, in the Scottish Centre of Macromolecular Imaging, uh, we have uh, James and Mari, who James is a facility manager, and Mari, our, our, our cryo-EM expert, who, who helps our users uh, freeze their samples and, and, and optimise them for, for data collection on the cryo arm. Uh, the SCMI grant was achieved uh, through uh, a, as a consortium with uh, colleagues in, in um, Edinburgh, Dundee, Glasgow and St Andrews and the uh, co-investigators on the award are listed there and the management group are listed. So the nodovirus structure I told you about was solved in collaboration with Cochlean uh, from Putra University in Malaysia. The data were collected at the Electron Bioimaging Centre at Diamond Light Source in, in Oxfordshire. The adenovirus structure was uh, determined uh, by a, a student in my lab, Kasim Warak, who's, uh, who uh, did a great job there. And that was very early on in his PhD as well. So that was, that was great. A Khaleesi virus work was a, a PhD project uh, for Michaela Conley in collaboration with uh, Ian Goodfellow of Cambridge University. And the data were collected in the University of Leeds at the As Asbury Biostructure Laboratory. The lumazine synthase is a collaboration with colleagues in the CVR uh, who were interested in the use of lumazine synthase as a as a, as a platform for, uh, for antigen display for vaccine technology, um, as Arvind and Vanessa and Sarah made the uh, protein for us and uh, James imaged it and, and we processed the data together. Herpes simplex virus tomogram I showed you was, uh, was the work of Rebecca Lauder, who uh, was working with my colleague Fraser Rickson. And the coronavirus tomography uh, that was collected in Scotland was in, in my lab was performed uh, by um, James, my, myself, uh, Sweta, David, uh, Lushu, and, and the, uh, the representation, that three-dimensional representation was from Gary Wren. So just to, of course also to thank all the uh, application specialists from Jail and Direct Electron who've helped us get the system up and running and, and uh, David Mastinado, his, his support in getting Serial EM running on, on, on our microscope, which was absolutely fantastic. And uh, thank you all for listening. And this is just the people who've paid for it all. So this is this is the, uh, the funding acknowledgement page. Uh, SCMI was established with a very large grant from the Medical Research Council uh, and these other funders. Um, and the Medical Research Council also funds my, my virology research. So thanks to them and thanks to you for listening.
yeah thank you very much uh, professor david vella although i am a material scientist uh, but uh, being electron microscopist uh, having great interest and uh, there are various topics which you have touched and it is uh, very important for even material science based uh, researchers to understand and some of them which were, were very appealing to me like you started with the starting with classical tm of macromolecular assemblies then determination of the fold of the core proteins of hepatitis b then uh, high resolution microstructure of icosahedral viruses because we also study in metallic systems the icosahedral quasi crystalline symmetry so the outer structure what you showed is it is more or less similar so mm -hmm. then the feature symmetry along three fold and so on in icosahedral viruses then uh, uh, you touched uh, some tomogram averaging of sars cov2 as i think it's uh, appealing to all of us who are listening this lecture and uh, then uh, lastly when you touched this uh, focused ion beam milling a window into the cell segmentation of the membrane and use of focused ion beam milling to study cryo et sars cov2 micro uh, this uh, morphogenesis the outer structures again uh, the morphology and all it's really overall very very interesting topic you have touched and um, it it was like uh, more interesting for material scientists uh, maybe more than the biological scientist <laughs> so that's what uh, i can i congratulate you and i really appreciate the kind of efforts we have put on and there are uh, many very uh, senior uh, electron microscopists of the country are uh, joined and they are li listening this uh, your very elucidative presentation i can see professor kamanyo chattopadhyay uh, on the screen uh, professor chattopadhyay please if you want to speak a few words professor chattopadhyay your mic is mute so what is that is okay <laughs> no no this is this is a great thing that we are having opportunity to listen to such a wonderful exposition of the microscopy particularly the life science micro use of microscope in life science yes and i am hoping that uh, many of the thing that we learned today are hard today i like to see that many of our people will be in the forefront of this kind of work yeah it's said they should draw the inspirations from this we do have many competent people young people now and personally i'm really looking forward to uh, many such topics not only from the foremost experts in the world but also from our country yeah okay. thank you sir uh, then i think we have uh, professor ravi shankar hello can you hear me yeah ravi yeah please yeah. Uh, thank you professor david balak for a really wonderful talk uh, so actually it is very interesting to see the parallels with the, how developments have happened for the material science tm so many of the things that you said were uh, things were happening in parallel but suddenly the explosion happened in case of the biological tm uh, the same sort of uh, instrumentation developments particularly the, the direct detection camera the field emissions all those things happened and so they also enabled atomic resolution or uh, sub atom resolution you should say in the case of material science so it's really interesting to see how this uh, went uh, the really interesting thing was that uh, biological specimens particularly things like viruses all of them are exactly identical and when we look at particles for example no two particles are identical so this one big advantage that you can have a strength in numbers you can collect from a very large number of uh, randomly oriented things and then can the average i guess that's it. i had a couple of quick questions if i may yes uh, yeah so sure i think yeah for the coronavirus actually why was the tomographic technique used rather than a single particle thing is there any specific reason or is it just a, uh, the choice of technique for tomography rather than single uh, particle 
analysis. So that's a, that's a good question. So, so single particle analysis has been applied to studying the spikes on corona, intact coronaviruses. In fact, in that, that paper from, uh, uh, from John Briggs and Sean Cheres, uh, uh, that, that, that paper, uh, they use both tomography and single particle analysis. So you can take an image of the whole virus and then just cut out the images of the, of the spikes and treat them as single particles. And that's been done. Um, and it, it's it actually, the, the challenge is, of course, that you've got all those spikes are kind of superimposed on each other. So as, as a computational challenge, it's, it's, it makes it harder uh, to determine their orientations accurately and disentangle the projected density of many, many objects. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, whereas uh, with with the membranous component, no, no amount of averaging is going to get you something useful because because these 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 structures are, are unique. You can't you can't average the whole virion together because the the, the spikes are, are sort of basically randomly positioned in a membrane. Okay. Uh, so so single particle is very powerful for for the the spikes and can, can be applied to the spikes on that and has been indeed. Uh, but generally, the um, the, the virion is, is better to solve it by tomography uh, if you want to okay. see the whole virion structure. Um, okay. And of course, in, in the lamellae, in the cell, uh, you need you need tomography to see those membranes. You 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 won't be able to apply single particle methods to the membranes. Okay. Another quick question, if I may. Uh, so the FIB presumably was using gallium ions. Is there a problem of implantation of gallium into these uh, fairly delicate structures? And well, app apparently not. Uh, so that's I, I have to be, I have to hold my hands up. So I am not an expert at, at, at that at that technique. Uh, we have been trying to implement it. We have some data that we've collected again in collaboration with the, with the group in in in, in uh, EBIC in Oxfordshire um, that we're preparing for publication, but we're not ready to publish yet. Um, it. I th it's se seemingly it's not a, a big issue. Um, there are, um, I know in, in, in groups now, there, there's interest in using the plasma based uh, focus ion beams uh, as uh, potentially a, a better option for, for biologicals, uh, but that, that's really just, just starting. Um, so certainly, I mean, I, 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 was, I would have expected quite severe radiation damage to be an issue as well, but I, I think, I mean, this, all, all of these technologies, I, 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 I've been speaking to a lot of material scientists, and I have to acknowledge, of course, that all of these technologies were developed and implemented by material scientists um, first. So, uh, focus line beam milling, of course, and this now in. Uh, focus line beam milling and, uh, of lamellae and lift out of lamellae uh, was, of course, developed uh, uh, as, as a material science technology uh, okay. before it was implemented uh, for life sciences. Um, I don't know how much people have actually looked to see using perhaps some, some, some sort of spectroscopy to see whether the gallium is, is in, embedded in the sample, but it doesn't seem to be deleterious, I think is the answer. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. So now um, I can see researchers, scientists from life sciences and material sciences both are sitting here. And now I request I hand over this virtual platform to Dr. Chetna Dhan for continuing a little bit more discussion if Professor David is available, and then to say what up thanks. Dr. Chetna Dhan. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so on the behalf of whole uh, AMSI society, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate our honorable speaker, Professor David Bella for his excellent and enriched lecture on recent advances in virus structure research using cryo-TEM that have covered many interesting uh, microscopic observations and research findings, uh, like uh, how cryo-TEM uh, uh, resolution evolved and applied to visualize different virus structures like uh, HSV1, hepatitis virus, then adenovirus, Kelsey virus, uh, then he has also covered that what are the different research challenges uh, in using cryo-TM technique in viewing amorphous and insulating biological structures. In his talk, he has also uh, mentioned that how cryo-TM uh, microscopy can be integrated with different computational models and automation softwares 
to design atomic models of proteins and also to retrieve high resolution 3D structures of proteins and viruses. He also illuminate uh, different technology, uh, technological developments in cryo EM to improve the imaging of the protein, viruses, and other biological structures. Uh, he showed very interesting uh, results from his lab on using cryo EM uh, to uh, view different virus structures, including, uh, I think, presently the most popular coronavirus structure and also shed light on how in situ cryo electron topology can be used uh, to analyze and visualize different cellular processes like uh, uh, the metamorphogenesis uh, he has mentioned. So a uh, very interesting talk, sir. Thank you so much uh, once again, sir, for, uh, for accepting our invitation uh, and delivering such a great lecture with deep insight uh, and getting us uh, aware with this uh, new aspect of electron microscopy. This lecture, I'm sure, will benefit everyone uh, in the audience. Uh, now, I would like to convey my sincere thank to our uh, respected director, sir, Dr. Avnish Kumar Srivastava, uh, President EMSI, for always encouraging us not only for knowledge generation, but also for knowledge dissemination in the form of lectures, uh, webinars, conferences, and so on. My deep thanks and acknowledgement to Dr. N.C. Mehra, uh, General Secretary e EMSI, Dr. N. Satish, Joint Secretary uh, EMSI, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar Mahapatra, Joint Secretary EMSI, for always so active and supportive towards the society activities. I also want to give my warm thanks to all the EMSI members and the participants for attending the webinar and making this event successful. Last but not the least, I would like to extend my thanks to our very supportive CSIR MPRI IT team. Without their assistance, it will be really difficult to conduct such online webinars so smoothly. Thank you very much to all once again for joining this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you again to speaker and to all participants. Thank you. Have a good stay and stay safe. Thank you Thank very you. much. process. Anything, Satish, you want to say? No, it's okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Bella. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's been, it's been, been okay. great. Thank you. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Bye bye now. <laughs>